So I want to talk a little bit about how the social relations change in terms of how workers are viewed, the role of workers in all of, in the organization. So again, in the tailor's conception, you've got kind of the individual, whether on the production line or in mental labor or whatever, and you're being rewarded as an individual or punished. In the framework that Toyota has made up, that doesn't really work. That's not very, um, doesn't help to reinforce how the system works. You want this self-improvement to be going on all the time. You want people to be pulling the and on cord and stopping the production line. You want all these kind of things we've we've talked about where there should be participation, voluntary, enthusiastic participation in process improvement in all of the things that workers would traditionally not want to do. Remember, like if you're a worker in, in a factory or something like that, usually the dynamic is you have a, a, a union, for example, and the management is trying to, with their expert system, they're trying to impose improvements, productivity improvements, things like that to the production system. And the union maybe will agree to it in exchange for concessions from the management. So usually that's the dynamic, you know, people are not enthusiastically engaged in, in losing their place on the production line. It, you know, it threatens your employment, right? Right. Um, so if you, if you improve the process and make it more efficient, you could do away with your own job. It's kind of a, it's the kind of one of the key contradictions in capital. Right. Exactly. So that's not, so it's not really, it doesn't really suit that kind of, that way of treating people doesn't really suit very well. The technical system that you've now got in place with the Toyota production system. So they started to re-examine this stuff and they said, okay, instead of having individuals, we'll have the idea of work teams. Now the small work team is basically the foundation of the organization in the TPS. The way I think about it is in terms of participation in a group chat, for example, in a WhatsApp or instant messenger. Well, if you are going to be working on a problem with other people, working on solutions and issues and so on, what should that group be in terms of the size of the group in the instant messenger? You know, you want to not only be able to understand the flow as a word of information, but you want to be able to contribute to it as well. You can see it would have to be a small group. It couldn't be a hundred people. It couldn't be 50 people. It would have to be, you know, a small group of people. And that, that's the kind of basis that they, that they said, okay, we, we want the small team to be the basis of process improvement. That small team should basically work on what were called work standards. So standardized work, not in the sense that work instructions that are passed down to you and you have to follow them, but this is a living, breathing type of uh, work standards where it's in the hands of the work team. The work team in the standard TPS model would have a leader and the leader is not really a leader. The leader is like a delegate, basically. The job of that person is to express the views that the work team think that thinks that there's a better way to perform the role that they have as a group. So this kind of the individual genius, as it were, which is what companies are trying to harvest in the Taylorist idea, that individual genius becomes part of that group chat, that group dynamic, and is not going on a solo run, doing their own thing and trying to beat their coworkers and trying to get the bonus while their coworker doesn't get it, which creates all, as everyone who has ever worked anywhere knows, creates all kinds of tensions. But instead of that, it is the group as a whole, which is working towards the kind of aims, right? So there's no, there's, we'll, we'll get onto the payment stuff in a moment, but basically, yeah. yeah they work towards a common goal. They work towards a common goal. And that's the whole idea of the total production system is to facilitate that. The common goal is to change the work standard, the standardized work that they're doing so that the entire organization can benefit from it. So if they have a better way of doing certain things, that becomes the standardized work and the standardized work method for that thing. And then that can be spread to other parts of the organization that are doing that same kind of standardized work. So that's a really core thing in the Toyota production system that you don't have individuals going on solar runs. You have standardized work that's being always improved, always reassessed. They can, the team can propose changes to the standardized work and then at a sort of group level, and a group would be a number of teams, basically, that can be accepted or not accepted depending on the wider requirements of the factory. So sometimes something that could be a good idea in one part of the factory would actually damage production for the factory as a totality or might cause some problems. So you always have to reconcile what individuals want to do, even what groups want to do with the requirements of the whole organization. But basically that's... So that's a very sorry. cybernetic kind of approach, isn't it? You know, like your the system as a whole, the higher management function, being able to condition the lower such as to maintain the integrity of the system of a whole where required. 
yeah, I mean, the whole thing is a cybernetic management system. So it's really the whole, this whole process is moving from a expert type system to a cybernetic type system in management. With the cybernetic type system, the organization as a whole has priorities. It has targets and goals, and those pass down to these work teams in all the different departments and sectors and production lines and so on. That's what the organization needs from those teams. That's the purpose of the roles in the company, of the work roles. And then the ways of achieving those roles are formulated through the self-organization of the workers and go back up. So they spread back up through the organization in recognition of whether they're an improvement on the current standard, the current working standards or not. If you were to read Stafford Beard, if you were to read other cybernetics theorists, you would come to really similar conclusions to what Toyota came to. So do you want to talk about the job guarantee and how this plays in? Yeah, this is all part of something that I call like the social relations bubble. Basically, the idea is that you live in a capitalist economy, so you don't actually have this common disposition of rules where everyone is working together cooperatively towards common outcomes. You have the other thing. In general, in society, you have the competitive labor market and the competitive business uh, environment and so on. So you have the, you have something much more like the much more compatible, if you like, with the Taylorist idea in principle, in the, in, in, as a generalized social production method. So what Toyota found that they needed to try to do, and they never fully did it. And people will say, people can give a million examples of where they completely did the opposite. And, you know, we can accept that hundred percent, but this is, I'm talking about the theory of the Toyota production system, which is really clear by all the people who made it and advocated it and have studied it. The theory of the Toyota production system is basically that all of those technical things we spoke about, the work teams, the standardization, the algodonic loops, none of it works really, unless certain material conditions are met. These common, the sort of the common rules of the TPS are in two types. First of all, there's social relations and material conditions that have to be met. And we'll talk about that in a minute, like wage structure and et cetera. Then also organizational or technical. And that's based on the stuff we've talked about, the, the small teams, organization and algodonics, the Andon system, the ability for the algodonic loop, the ability for the system to improve itself. So both of them are indispensable. It works again as a package system, as a totality, a holistic system, the same as the Taylorist idea. But in order for it to work as a holistic system in a capitalist environment, it needs to create a sort of, a sort of bubble, if you like of different social relations which exist within the company. And that's where this second leg of requirements is there, the sort of material social relational requirements. Now, one of the main components of that is the wage structure. So there are examples where Toyota, and certainly by the theory of the Toyota production system, where wages should be equalized for, if you like, at the parallel level in the system. That's how they see it. So people who are in the same kind of role in the company. They're doing the same work. They're working together in work teams. Potentially they're going to be joining other work teams who are doing similar things and so on. They should all be on the same income. And so what that means is you don't have bonuses related to seniority. You don't have bonuses related to output or productivity or any of these things that you see in the Taylor's system. You're not evaluating people as individuals relative to an ideal worker. What you're doing is you're trying to create the conditions for teamwork to produce this information, which is the improved standard ways of doing work. And the best way to do that is to remove that conflictual relationship that would be there within those, within the small team environment, uh, which you would get by having people essentially competing against each other. So that's, it's a, a really important part of it is this roles theory idea that you're not talking about individuals, you're talking about roles within the organization and those roles within the organization have a very specific place within the framework of the small team and within the small team's ability as a unit to improve the functioning of the organization. So that's the whole, that's the different approach that the TPS brings. So this whole idea of roles theory is very important in the TPS because it fits with that whole set of requirements we've spoken about. Like in TPS, the processes in the organization should improve so that instead of depending on the outstanding work of some individuals using these like 
individual focused metrics that we spoke about with Taylorism. Instead, you have this small work team idea about process improvement through the improvement of standardized work methods. And indeed, it's to that task that the individual's genius working with others is, is applied. So uh, you harness it, but in a different way. From a social relational point of view, therefore, you're not interested in rewarding the individual for going on a, a solo run and for figuring out how they can beat the management's targets. Instead, you're interested in basically minimizing intra-group conflict. And you do that by creating this common disposition of material conditions that allows for teamwork to happen. What does that mean? A common disposition of material conditions. Fundamentally, it means that if you participate in the organization, according to your role in it, you can't be disadvantaged either in absolute terms, like say losing your job or getting a pay cut or in relative terms, like getting less than your colleagues for participation in the teamwork. This means basically you can focus on this participation without these material concerns and potential points of conflict. Now, if you're not suited to a certain role that's, and you want to do something else, well, that's a different matter, but your participation in a team is what's required by the organization and within the team, according to a certain role that they're interested in. And so bonuses, for example, money bonuses and stuff like that, where they do exist are paid out on a common basis in the TPS, according to the TPS theory. And, and again, that's to reinforce the social relations that the TPS needs. So why do we care about that from the perspective of socialism? Well, in terms of associated labor and socialism, we should be thinking about a generalization of those, of that common disposition of material conditions and the organizational structure that reinforces it. And you find that in the TPS. And so the fascinating thing for us is that the most modern production works in this holistic totality and that holistic totality is really composed of being cybernetically improved relative to Taylorism's like expert system and also requiring material equality which allows for the organizational forms that work with the TPS based on small teams in other words material equality and security it's not to say that Toyota implements a lot of this but these are the conclusions of the theory a reason you could say that it, you don't see this in capitalism is that in a capitalist economy, it would be very difficult to make the case for a generalization of material equality and security like this calls for, especially in, you know, senior levels of management and so on. But in a socialist society that isn't based on a labor market, et cetera, and hierarchical social roles, then it's absolutely possible. Right. And it shows the strength of a labor time accounting approach that everybody's, you know, the standard communist thing that everybody's labor is treated equally and ironically capitalism has to create these kind of like toyota has figured out that to get m the most productive capitalist production they have to create these little kind of islands of kind of pseudo communist relations so everybody on the team has gets the same pay and their their bonus is linked to the overall general performance of the company so they're not aligned to just their own production of their own little widget or whatever it is, or tightening their bolt or whatever that thing is. It's the general production of cars in Toyota as a whole that they're linked to. And even the team leader, like, like to show just for, so people who can see like, you know, how equal the pay thing is. Like I, there was a case in where they took over a company in America. And I think, you know, this is from the eighties or whatever, but I think that the average wage was like, you know, $16 an hour for everybody. And then the team leader on their team got like 40 cents an hour more. That's how small it was. What's, what's weird is though, it is kind of crazy like that this idea to reducing waste, you know, led them down this, this road towards like essentially these kind of pseudo communist relations and this, this kind of job guarantee. I mean, like it was the best way to solve these kind of production issues, which kind of, says something fundamental about socialism because capitalism finds it essentially impossible to generalize these insights, you know, even within Toyota itself, it is only able to really generalize them at the production layer at the, it, it doesn't do it through the higher ranks of management, right? Even though theory would tell you it would be better, right? That it is only like through alienated labor 
can you, sorry, through unalienating labor, can you really free the forces of production from the social relations of production, right? That, you know, this is a, a, an example of a massive fetter on the capitalist mode of production, one that like Marx, you know, maybe said some stuff about alienated labor, but certainly didn't develop in anything like this detail or I had no knowledge of the these kind of implications. So it's like, it's kind of like an, an, another fundamental fetter that a socialist society would be able to just like explode. We're always talking about the fundamental principles <laughs> in this podcast, but there's a really good little quote from it, a little paragraph. I'll just read it out here because I have it in front of me. But th obviously they're talking about something a bit different, but it's it speaks to the same kind of idea. So they say, the demand for equality does not appear to be an ethical or moral one at all, but rather arises from the necessary production conditions of communist economic life. Here, equality is not an ethical term, but an economic one. It wants to express nothing other than that production in all associated organizations proceeds according to the same rules in order to make possible a common disposition of the production apparatus. To make these rules binding for the whole production is the essential task of the proletarian revolution. So their whole idea was that through the enforcement of a new accounting system through a single public ledger at the social level, that all production at the micro level would communally reproduce together instead of individual businesses reproducing so that there's no longer any economic exploitation. Now, that's really interesting because it's both a cybernetic point, like we've been talking about, and it's very bound up in the Marxist view that a technical system here, so for them, a single ledger for the whole society, acts as a sort of technical component of the economic base, a sort of concretization for the communist social relations of production. So again, it's like in this Toyota production system stuff as well, social relations can't just see, be suspended in midair. They have to concretely manifest and reproduce themselves in specific ways. And so people engage with each other socially and economically in specific ways within social production that are consistent with the economic base and with, with how the whole system reproduces itself materially. So a lot of the Toyota production system is really a management system, like we've discussed, and has technical advantages, and superiority over the Taylorist idea. But actually, it's both enabled by and enables what are pseudo-communist relations of production. Yeah, like it's impossible without this higher level of productivity and efficiency is literally impossible without pseudo-communist kind of relations of production. You know, I do, I do find it quite shocking that all these things that come out of it, it it's a kind of a, an, an amazing kind of deep cybernetic point that self-organization and optimization can only be done by those that are, that are motivated to do it. Like, like that in order to actually have the self-organization of production towards, directed towards its optimization, that can only be done via unalienated labor. It cannot be done by alienated labor. And that's a very deep point. And it's a kind of this kind of bridge between kind of cybernetics and, and class analysis. Yeah, I, I think so. And again, the idea that you can't really mix and match these things, it, they kind of work as, as a holistic totality. So there's, it's a very, there's a really interesting history, a huge body of work on so-called improvement initiatives and there's stuff like lean manufacturing and uh, lean sigma and kaizen specialists they got you know and really kind of cringe kind of sounding things like master black belts in kaizen and stuff and the whole these are taken thing. like these are taken like the technical element yeah, yeah, yeah. as well like they, so like they look at the you know a, a part of the tool production system we haven't really gone into the detail because it's not really so important but like there are technical things that they have figured out how to do and that people try and People, other companies try and they go, they don't want to do all, well, they don't want to deal with the philosophy and the social relations stuff, but they say, oh, we, we could just take this technical exercise and do it. But like this transportation of exercises doesn't get them what the Toyota production system gives them. Go on, sorry, I interrupted your flow. No, fundamentally, they don't want the roles system of dispersing authority and responsibility throughout the organization. They don't want the equal 
material guarantees and material conditions. They don't want any of that. They want the ability to fire people, to dock people's pay, to give people bonuses. They want all of those management tools. And so it's kind of, it's a really interesting idea because, because the general social relations in capitalism are much more towards the Taylorist thing. What happened was that all of these companies that existed and suddenly there was this lean so-called revolution where people were all taking notice of how effective Toyota's system was in the eighties and nineties. They all turned around and said, how can we get the benefits of this without having to restructure our company in this way? So they said, okay, you know, we'll just take some of the technical techniques and even this kind of idea like black belts and stuff. We'll just like make a specialist who's in charge of this stuff. And that person will have the role of enforcing it or whatever. And what happens in reality, and there's been a lot of empirical work on it, what happens in reality is you can make people sort of engage in these kind of things for a short time and you give them pep talks and you say, now we're all going to improve our processes and everyone's going to get stuck in and so on. And within a very short period of time, it goes back to the way it was. The continual improvement stuff all stops. There are some gains in the beginning, but the whole system, the TPS is based on worker self-organization and the conditions for it under that traditional management uh, framework just don't exist. So it doesn't repro- the system doesn't reproduce itself. You can't have the TPS without the TPS. So this is all very interesting, but it's even kind of, there's even more to say about what it means for, for socialism and what, what the TPS and pull production mean about economic planning and socialist economic planning. Yeah, so basically a lot of the socialist ideas of planning that are out there and have been out there for the last century are based on the received wisdom that Fordist production and, you know, this whole Taylorist system, which was adopted by the Soviet Union early on and made into a sort of national system, that in some sense what you need to do is refine that and make it better and make it more precise and so on. Really, they haven't the people who are advocating those kind of things that never dealt with the real state of modern industry, which doesn't work in that way. They haven't dealt with the real state of modern industry, a lot of which does not work in that way, especially in the high and medium, even technology levels of manufacturing. Now, the thing to understand about it is in those areas, it wouldn't be possible for them to go back to push production. It wouldn't really be possible for those supply chains to return to that without a sort of enormous uh, loss of all of the things we've discussed. You know, like it wouldn't be possible to go backwards, no more than, say, what, you know, Marx used to critique Proudhon for wanting to return to small scale artisan production as the basis for socialism. That the, the, the evolution from this kind of Fordist approach to a TPS approach it's so unbelievably more efficient and productive than, say, the Fordism. Like in the books that we've been reading, like the empirical evidence of our improvements in the first few years of the order of like six, seven hundred percent increases in productivity, right? Like as in, it's just such a massive jump. It's as big a jump as like what Marx would have called modern industry and then mass production was compared to that. And now pull production, the TPS compared to the Fordist system. That there's no there's no going back, there's no time machine to go back to a different system as the basis for socialism. Yeah, and even the way that modern factories work, where it tends to be, we discussed already this kind of Kanban system where production tends to be based on demand and so-called just-in-time pulling demand through supply chains. Now, to various extents, that's effectively implemented, but in general, that's, that is widely ubiquitous at this stage. To go back to a situation where people have to pre-plan their production orders from a planning department, which is the usual position, socialist planners, would be a huge technical would be seen as a huge technical step backwards by industry. It would be seen as going back most of a century in terms of how production is organized, because it reintroduces all the things that we spoke about, all of the the waste, the overproduction in between production steps, the huge inefficiencies. And so yeah. Any modern industrial engineer working in any modern industry would would just dismiss the idea. And I think that's maybe a problem that you have with socialist planning circles where they're not up to speed on how modern industry works. They're working off of models and discussions that were taking place a century ago. 
it means that like you cannot actually have a centrally planned input output table approach because that's if we think about it what what does it do it looks at the problems of the soviet union and says well you know what the problem is you know we didn't centralize enough right we need like everything centralized any kind of proper cybernetic analysis of that will show that the center will not have the requisite variety it is essentially like the uber expert system you know where it puts all the experts in like you know the goth plan head offices you know the problem is that everything wasn't centralized we need more and more and more centralizing instead of more and more self-organization yeah exactly cybernetically it's like you have the aims of the organization or in this case the aims of the society are sort of they can be set at a high level cybernetically but then the actual solutions and how those things are achieved and how the processes develop and so on that's all that all has to be the function of self-organized activity from the bottom you can't have a situation where we, we, you know like what they tried in the soviet union for example where you have gosudarsan the standard you have state standards and the idea is the state will tell every factory exactly how everything must be done that's a the tailorist expert system idea you can do it but it's very inefficient right i feel like we should be hammering it more here now like what the tps teaches us what the tps shows us is that essentially you know it's the nail in the coffin of the central planning ideas of these totalizing central planning ideas and that it requires a complete change in how socialism socialist planning needs to be conceived of as in what it is to plan right what is planning right because you know this associating of socialist planning with dudes in a office with some some supercomputers solving input output matrices it's actually got nothing to do with planning in the real world it's this this idea of the solver it's got nothing to do with planning if we look at what is the equivalent of the solver right in the tps who is it donald it's well, like the dudes yeah. on the production line they're oh, solving right. the optimum produce op, optimal production techniques and constantly refining them and standardizing them and sending them sharing them with the within the company itself that this this optimization of production is actually done by the people on the production line it's not done and it cannot be done in the central office they can't what how, how could they possibly do it right mm -hmm. all that a, a solver can do if we think about it all that a solver can do is it can look at all the technical coefficients of all the factories so let's say we have our big goss plan and we have all the input output stuff from each factory and they say you know this process in the factory takes so much metal and so much rubber and produces this amount of outputs and they use this type of machine and blah 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 and this amount of workers and this other one has the same machine but it uses a bit more metal and a little bit a bit more rubber and more workers all that goss plan can actually do all the solver can do is say to the to the second factory copy what the first factory is doing in their production don't do it your way <laughs> right right but like what is that that's just a that's just a standardization of work processes right that happens in the tps without no need for any solver and it'll be way more efficient right and these things will propagate in a in in a, in a, in a system uh, properly socialist communist society it would be in everybody's interest to propagate these things so like not only are these centralized planning things just cybernetically completely illogical capitalism shows us what to do in yep. some sense capitalism has solved it right but it can't really properly implement it but it knows that it should but it can't i think there's a really fundamental argument as well against this kind of centrally planned socialist idea because the expert system that it is based on social relationally as we've discussed is fundamentally like alienating it's suited to wage labor it's the idea of passing down and then passing down instructions and evaluating people on their success as waged employees carrying out the instructions of their masters basically and that's fundamentally 
those are social relations that are unsuited to socialism that are in contradiction with associated production and so i think that's uh i i don't feel like that that's an objection that any central planning advocates can ever get around i don't see how they can because that would be the experience of every worker in such an economy whether or not you say they can you know every individual contributes a one millionth or one fifty millionth part to the to the social production plan or something like that but what you would experience under that system would be a highly alienating form of essentially wage labor right and i think there's also this deep fundamental point about ideas around like can everybody pl- get involved in planning the economy just cybernetically that's that's just not possible everybody can't plan everything i can't get involved in planning pens and shoes and you know microchips and whatever i i can literally only do what uh, what I, I know or improve what i'm working on you know i can be involved in some general large scale stuff like yeah we should have more healthcare or we should have less pollution or these type of decisions but you cannot you cannot ask everybody to plan all 100 million 200 500 million products it's like we do not have the in cybernetic terms we don't have the requisite variety we don't have the you know we literally our brains not big enough to be able to handle all that information and be able to come up with ideas on, on it so like we have division of labor like in socialism. And this means that like planning cannot be this, you or me or any person in this society could not have any real opinion on the detailed production plans of everything in the world. You just, you just cannot, you can't have an opinion on it that's meaningful. So actually, you know, our participation is at the point of maybe general directions and then in our actual working life how we interact with the system and how we help plan our area. Similarly, you know, we live in a certain part and how we can impact what happens in that general uh, locality. And what makes it socialist is that all of it happens according to a common disposition of the production system and people, how people relate to the product of production so that there's, you don't have economic exploitation and profits and you have a system basically of cybernetically valid participation in social production. Right. There is a socialist political economy, which is cybernetically valid based upon unalienated labor. And that cannot be through the central plan. Like it literally cannot be through the central plan. It's impossible. And the only way is through self-organization and the kind of general idea of the VSM where you have the top decision body, the system five, is making essentially general directives, right? The system and its political economy, how the social relations work, self-organize it to maintain that structure as a whole. The people making the decisions that we want such and such type of ecosystem, we want such and such a type of healthcare or education or communal living or whatever it is, that feeds down through and it is self-organized within social relations that are communist and not capitalist. And that's what socialism is. And it cannot be anything else. It can't be this cockshot input output matrix telling everybody what to do. It literally can't be it because if it was to be it, it would be vastly less productive than capitalism in the higher stages of capitalism, what we call lean just in time production. It cannot compete with it. So it's not a mode of production. Right. 